This is a work with um, uh, one organizer, Roma, Saranga Padakrishna, Brad and Ware, uh, about uh, mostly uh, spin transport in uh, uh, spin chains, um, where we uh, found some uh, uh, cute, interesting uh, behavior uh, in the isotropic limit, anisotropic limit. And uh, where, as you see, okay, GHD would provide the basis to understand this. Uh, this behavior. But okay, so uh, um, if uh, we're willing to start a bit from uh, far, um, so okay, at least uh, the way I, uh, I like to see, or at least the way I was um, uh, educated to think about it, is that of course we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, strong interactive systems out there that we, we don't know what to do about them. And because we, we cannot solve them, uh, but at least in this uh, galaxy of, uh, of uh, interacting system, we have some points where uh, we know how to use some analytical methods and these are the integrable points, right? So, I mean, uh, of course, our beloved model, like the Lieblinger, uh, in a sense, uh, help us to understand a lot of behavior, for example, of uh, interacting called atoms and so on. But uh, even if they're in, integrable and uh, we know to do something, uh, we still have to face the fact that uh, their eigenstates are not simple at all. I mean, the better wave functions are not simple at all. They are still, uh, they still contain an exponential amount of information, right? There's some over, the way you usually write them is uh, as um, a sum of a permutation, because at each particle you associate uh, some parameter, which could be uh, real or complex, theta rapidity and then because you have two body scattering in the process then the wave function is allowed to permute uh, these uh, parameters around all particles so um, obtaining information about the integrable system is still hard and uh, and that's why it would be nice to have a, a more uh, coarse grained picture <clears throat> and that's the whole idea of uh, in classical physics that leads to other dynamics right you you forget about um, the interactions, uh, or you forget about the dynamics of a single particle in a fluid, and you just look at the coarse grain picture, like the, how uh, a density imbalance relax, and this indeed give you, for example, the fixed law diffusion, <clears throat> which is now all the information about the microscopic model are contained in one single parameters. Uh, still, of course, uh, the complex, I mean, how to reconstruct this parameter is, uh, is a very complex tax, and, and we have seen indeed this morning uh, um, how can one think uh, how to extract this. But okay, if now we limit ourselves to the to models that have the dynamic which is integrable, still um, indeed you have this uh, better wave function which is complicated, and you want to extract relevant information from this, and you want to do it indeed uh, according to the dynamics. And one reason is okay, it's not just a merely merely an academic question because you would say okay, but well, these are again just points in the space of interacting system. But one reason is that if you have a more coarse grain picture, you can use it to explore what is around them in, in much more easier fashion than you would have if you just know the wave function. So in a sense, the the dynamic. I think one of the greatest success of um, of um, these uh, effective autonomics of uh, interacting integrable system is really that now we have a way to go beyond uh, integrability and really uh, understand uh, what is around uh, integrable system. And uh, okay, so all these ideas brought us to uh, to the theory of generalized dynamics, which uh, okay, this. Uh, it's also pointless now to derive it, uh, all of it, because I will not need it. But anyway, so it's, uh, it's just doing other dynamics as, as usual, and uh, as uh, already Benjamin talked uh, Monday, uh, we're basically writing continuity equations for, um, for, for the other dynamic parameters, and the other dynamic parameters that we choose are the expectation value of the local densities of conserved quantities. So if you have, this is generic for any system, if you have n conserved quantities, you have a continuity equation for each of them. And the continuity equation usually reads as uh, some, um, the, there is some, some current that, and this current, you should usually expand it in your hydrodynamic state. And um, the first term is what's called the Euler current. 
the second higher order terms, at least the first one is the is the what's responsible for diffusion of viscosity and uh, and it's regulated by this coefficient, which are on Sager terms. But okay, this uh, <clears throat> this is all very generic. Uh, the point of the generalized dynamics is also that you can rewrite, basically you can reparameterize <clears throat> the this field of other dynamic parameters into a field of uh, density of Gaussian particles. So this rho theta of x and t. Now it's a field. It's a, in a, in space and theta. <clears throat> so at each position x, you have a, a function of theta. That completely is by give you all information you need to know about this hydrodynamic parameter. So in a sense, just a parameterization, but it's a very useful one <clears throat> because it allows you, for example, to write Euler current very easily, and because they take the form of just density times effective velocity. And um, and this what this effective velocity is simply takes into account the fact that uh, this quasi particle you, now you can really have a kinetic picture interpretation on them. And that's what indeed helps a lot to understand different phenomena. And uh, when they travel into the system, they do two body scattering. So they get shifted by phase shift T, uh, which of course can be its function of uh, their, uh, their momenta and energy. And, um, and all this re repeated um, sh uh, phase shift can be summed over in what's called the dressing operation. So in a sense, the dressing is like, is what happens if I take a, like a single particle function, I, I let it go through the system. At the end, it will be dressed by the, all the interaction with all the particles in my fluid, okay? Um, and this dressing indeed goes into the velocity, so the velocity gets renormalized by this dressing. But nevertheless, the form is extremely simple. And you can also define uh, the filling, like free fermionic filling, which is the density divided by moment. <clears throat> but okay, so this JHD now uh, was invented now almost five years ago. Um, uh, <clears throat> now recently we extended to uh, the most generic case if you have like uh, external forces, so it's uh, non-homogeneous Hamiltonians. Uh, you can every, every, anyway uh, write it as a continuity equation for this density of the particle that always read like an effective um, flux of them. So the way they change, there is a flux and there is a spreading. And the spreading now can be in any direction, both in X and theta. So you have, uh, as Benjamin was saying Monday, you have a, a two-dimensional fluid and this two-dimensional fluid, basically there is a, con Continuity equation for this uh, for this for the density of this fluid in uh, x and theta so that reads like this. <clears throat> and okay, so I will not go into this direction because okay, you, well, here you can also prove that that entropy uh, and ent entropy production of this fluid is always positive, and there is always thermalization as long as there are forces. So in a sense, as long as there, is, there are acceleration on the theta direction. But okay, uh, so uh, what so we'll do today is mostly focus on uh, a specific model because still uh, give us a lot of surprise. And it's the Heisenberg chain, or at least around the Heisenberg chain, okay? And in particular, we want, uh, we are interested in the uh, spin transport dynamics of this model, as uh, indeed today is perfect day to, to talk about spin transport because indeed it's, uh, we've seen talks on this Monday, the, this morning on um, how to extract the, um, the hydrodynamic part of the spin transport in uh, interacting spin chain. So what uh, usually is, uh, one is interested in is in the um, uh, conductivity sigma of omega, which is just a Fourier transform of the uh, so-called dense uh, current-current correlation. Sorry, yeah, there's uh, too many commas. Uh, this current-current correlation, of course, this product, you, you should see it as an expectation value at some final temperature. Usually it's infinite, but it could be a final temperature too. Um, it's not, um, you can see it as a trace. Usually there is also like a Kumo-Mori product, but this usually doesn't change uh, our prediction. And of course, if you're interested in the long time, in the aerodynamic part of this conductivity, you're interested in what happens as small omega. So when transport gets basically close to the DC conductivity of the system, if you just plug two batteries at the end and see what's the transport. Okay, so now um, many things, some things were new, new even before GHD, some things are new about this. Uh, so it was kind of new that in this regime, if delta is between zero and one, transport is ballistic, which means that uh, 
this uh, sigma omega as a discontinuity at the, I mean, as a delta at omega equals zero because basically this current current correlation does not decay in time. Uh, the coefficient is called root weight, studied by um, different people and also at the end of the 90s. Um, the regime delta bigger than one, it was kind of known that it's diffusive, namely there is no root weight and the uh, sigma omega, it's regular at omega zero. Uh, but this of course was confirmed now with the GHD, which understand now why root, uh, root weight zero and uh, understand how to extract this diffusion constants. What is new, it's about the point delta equal one, where um, as we've seen on Monday, uh, now even uh, has been seen also experimentally, the dynamical exponent here is not add one, is not two from diffusion, neither one from ballistic, it's actually uh, three over two, <coughs> uh, um, sorry, two over three. Uh, which is the kadal parisi zang dynamic exponent. And this can be seen also at the level of the conductivity uh, from the fact that the conductivity diverges as omega to the minus one over three. So, our, um, so let's just go quickly on uh, how to understand all these different regimes. So uh, in this regime, um, the easy plane, if you want, uh, we understand why there is ballistic uh, transport. And uh, so what, usually if there is a ballistic transport is because you can actually have an overlap between some of the concert quantity in the system and your current, right? Because if you just take uh, this part of the conductivity, which is, the, which is just the large time limit of, this, um, of the uh, current current correlations, so what you usually do is hydrodynamic projection, right? In here, in between this product, you insert a resolution of identity, an operator resolution of identity uh, written in terms of the concert quantities, right? And usually if they're not orthogonal, you have to orthogonalize them with, uh, with the C matrix, which is actually the susceptibility matrix. <clears throat> so uh, if one of these products uh, is non-zero, you have a finite value and this indeed it's a lower bound in general for the root weight, but for the integrable system, you can sum over all of them. And this gives you exactly the root uh, matrix, uh, which you can write as this, where B is the product of current with charges. <clears throat> so in this regime, those charges do exist. Uh, they do exist, they have, a, they have a very special form. They are fractals actually, uh, or, may, or at least nowhere discontinuous in this regime. That's the reason why the root weight is nowhere continuous function. Uh, already observed by much frozen uh, uh, some, time, some time ago. <clears throat> but okay, so then if you're interested in the, the expression for the root weight given by GHT, you see that uh, it takes a very simple form. It just uh, tell you that you have to take uh, um, the charge. Uh, so for each, uh, for each type of particle that you have in your system, which can be just uh, many because uh, in this kind of chains, you can have particles that are made by different bound states. So you have to count them all. You sum over the density of all these particles and uh, then you multiply just by the amount of a charge square that they carry as they move. And the amount of charge is just the renormalized charge, this man the, dre the address manualization times their velocity, their respective velocity. <clears throat> okay, and this, uh, of course, this is just an approximation, but you can really write in a, in a formula like this, and this completely gives you the root weight. Now, if delta is bigger than one, uh, it's different. There is no root weight, uh, which somehow tells you that there is no ballistic transport. Uh, and only if the if you want the magnetic field is zero, or if you want if you are in a in a half filling or a not polarized state. Any polarized, any non-polarized thermal state has uh, zero root weight. How, uh, how we understand this? Well, there is a very uh, nice uh, argument. And basically you have to see um, transport in the regime as this. You have like, uh, you can see all these ty different type of quasi particle as um, bound states or man magnets. And there are, of course, there are single magnets, but there are also like bound states of them. This is a picture which is only valid at very large delta, but it's anyway a good also finite delta. So when the magnets uh, move, the magnets is the only one that moves uh, almost freely in the system. But when it arrives to uh, when impact one of these uh, bound states actually cannot move anymore because you have some kind of a preservation of number of domain walls. So, but this hole actually can actually move now inside the, mount, the bound states. And basically 
inside the bound, the bound state, the magnets flip, it's like effectively flip sign. So flip sign and becomes whole. So now at the end of the process, the magnets has passed through the, the, the bound states. The bound states actually has hoped on one side. Um, but uh, this is effective magnetization actually as a, as a flat weight. And then now if you think this is in a very large system, on the, when it hits so many of these uh, bound states, then its effective magnetization is actually zero. But you can put yourself at some finite, uh, some finite magnetization and then uh, um, and see that uh, how the, you can check how this effective magnetization decays in time. In the case as one of the square root of the system that uh, the, the magnon has explored. And uh, therefore in the case as one of a V times T, <clears throat> a square root of V times T. And now, if, if you look at your current current correlation expression, uh, if there was a drood weight, uh, it would um, basically diverge as T times drood weight, but the drood weight itself is uh, actually decaying as uh, uh, one over T. Right, because the velocity here in the case is one over square root of t, and the drood weight square of the velocity. So basically, you just go to a constant value, which is indeed your DC conductivity. And you have an expression now for the DC conductivity, which indeed has only one velocity, if you, if you see, because one of the velocity has been subtracted by this effective system size. And it has the basically the derivative of the fluctuation of this um, uh, effective magnetization, which now is not zero anymore. Okay, so this gives you a formula for the for the diffusion constant that you can plot at infinite temperature, and this was all known. Um, you can introduce a picture for this, which is basically um, you can understand this as some effective screen in time, right? You can really think in terms of like memory matrix formalism. So as I said, if you have um, when you try to compute current current correlation, you indeed you can insert a resolution of identity for uh, for the conserved charges. But what you know is that uh, if the uh, if you have two dynamics at different scales, so uh, one fast dynamics and one short dynamics, where the actually the conserved charges are actually decaying, are actually modified in time. You can use indeed this uh, memory matrix formalism, which nothing else, and then just tell you, okay, now you have uh, you, uh, you have this um, overlap between the current and the conserved charges, but the conserved charge itself depends on time, with some relaxation rate, right? So which is with some uh, uh, tau of L. <clears throat> so this gives you indeed the uh, expression for the conductivity sigma of omega, which now has some decay in time given by some uh, effective time. So here, this model is still integrable. We are not destroying the quasi-particle, but we are actually uh, uh, introducing the fact that the, this, this quasi-particle are getting demagnetized as they travel to the system. And they get demagnetized in, in, uh, into, uh, by a screening time, which is actually uh, the time that they need to meet quasi-particle of larger size. So you just compute it as one over the velocity divided by the density of quasi-particle larger sizes. <clears throat> and okay, you know the density of this quasi-particle always decay in a certain way in thermal states. And the magnetization now, which is not dress, because you see the dress one is zero. Here we put the bare one, which is equal S, and we take time tau to, for becoming dress, namely zero. So if you, uh, and now here you really see the difference. For delta large the one, you still see uh, diffusion, you still see nothing because this velocity actually exponentially decay in an S. So this sum always converge and the sum is always finite and for any omega. Uh, but for that like one actually be, uh, this time, this uh, screening time becomes also polynomial in S. So the screening time diverge in S. And if you resum this sum, actually you get your uh, omega to the minus one third, okay? Uh, this uh, nice uh, physical argument that really tells you how uh, this special divergence in omega really comes from the interplay between the fact that how the velocity of this larger quasi particle decay with the size and a delta equal one is actually one over uh, their size due to the fact that actually there are Goldstone modes. And this is actually very generic. It's not for, uh, it's not for Eisenberg, just for Eisenberg, it's for any uh, integrable or at least any um, <clears throat> non uh, integrable system with non abelian charges. Uh, and, but in, okay, in the case that we call one larger than one doesn't tell you anything. It just tell you that the, you should expect regular sigma omega diffusion and that's it. <clears throat> 
Um, okay, uh, so maybe I should go a bit faster now. Um, now we, going to, we want to go beyond integrability. So we want to add uh, perturbation to our Eisenberg chain. So of course, if you have ballistic transport, again, using memory matrix formalism, you know that the root weight, the delta of omega should be just get spread in a Lorentzian fashion by the presence of a finite lifetime for the Gaussian particle. This is basically all that people do when they do a quantum Boltzmann uh, equation, right? That you have to find what's the effective Gaussian particle acceleration rate. And this gives you basically what's the, what's the diffusion constant, what's the, the Lorentzian spreading of the conductivity. Indeed, if you take a free fermion, uh, just the X, Y chain and you add noise, then the relaxation rate just given by gamma, gamma the strength of noise, diffusion constant is one over gamma. Super simple, it's a nice calculation you can do in two lines. Um, if your system, if your model is interacting, now it's a problem because your, 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 your time scale actually depend on the, depend on the type, type of Gaussian particle. So for, for delta equal one, you can have a different behavior depending on the type of perturbation you can do. But let me just uh, skip that. And uh, let me go now for delta larger than one. Now here, what we are doing, we have a, a, a system that already display diffusive transport and we want to perturb it. Now, now the, the Hamiltonian is now chaotic, so it should be not integrable, which already should display, uh, display diffusion. So uh, we are going from diffusion to diffusion. So in a sense, we should expect that the, that the perturbation when it's small enough should do nothing. Indeed, um, but now uh, one should notice that this model, uh, a large delta, has a, has a very specific uh, kinetic constraints. Basically, there is a conservation of domain walls. And, uh, and uh, recently, indeed, uh, the CERC collaborator, they studied like random uh, um, gates models. Uh, where well, you also implement uh, kinetic constraint. Now, the one that will interest us is the, the one that's called XNOR. And basically it prevents uh, it prevents hopping that uh, changed number of domain of domain wall uh, in the system. Okay. And this is very similar to what's happening in your in our model. Now the only difference is that uh, if the mod is the system is integrable, uh, gates are not random, right? The, 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 but uh, by in a sense, the way how scattering are, appears is the same. And you see that indeed in this XNAR gates, which is a random model, you have a very similar dynamics here is plotted. You have this uh, large bound state that stayed the same and single manions that start just hope uh, in a diffusive fashion. And whenever they cross this bound state, actually they have the same effect. They, from, from plus, they become uh, minus when they cross this bound state. So they also change sign. They also have this screening of magnetization. So now what is the idea? Is that if we already seen that uh, the, the, um, the screening of magnetization is what makes you go from a finite root weight to a constant DC conductivity, but now on top of that, if you also add the fact that uh, this effective velocity is not anymore constant, but is actually decay decays as one of a square root two t due to the noise in your system, you actually get to this naive guess that the current current correlation should decay as t to the one of. Namely, you should have subdiffusion. Now, this looks like a naive guess, but actually if you try it, if you take your x and z for a relatively large delta, and you add noise, you actually see this behavior. So now what I'm plotting here is the diffusion constant as function of time that you can extract just by compute, looking at the variance of the spin uh, as function of time, taking the time derivative, uh, times delta. So times delta uh, for different value of delta, the diffusion constant so basically decays as square root of time. Um, to uh, go to a constant value, which is uh, proportional to one over delta, and is uh, almost independent of uh, the gamma of your strength of perturbation. And uh, basically it does this in a time scale order of delta square over gamma. <clears throat> so if it was integrable, if gamma would be zero, this diffusion constant would just go to a constant value, of course. But now, as soon as gamma is a so as final value, you see this drop in the diffusion constant. So indeed, at, uh, uh, so you see, this is the diffusion constant uh, uh, in the integrable model, and it goes at large gamma more or less to a value which is constant in delta, which is four, four over three pi. 
what you instead see at final gamma is the two different behavior. Basically, it starts growing a little bit. It would like to go to the integrable value, but soon uh, at time one over gamma recognize that there is backscatter in the system. So manuals start to be backscatter. They start to do random walks. So now you're precisely in the, in the XNOR uh, gates model, effectively, <clears throat> okay? Until basically the, uh, you don't hit another time scales. At this time so scale, which is- 26, just, just okay. uh, to give you four, a heads up. Four minutes. I have four minutes. Yeah, yeah, until the questions. Okay. So until you don't get this to this other time scale, which is delta square over gamma. This delta square over gamma is basically time scales where the systems pr start producing extra magnets, right? In XNOR gates, you will not produce them, but here because you uh, you have uh, you can uh, you are actually breaking the integrability of the system, you start producing these extra magnets that contribute to diffusion. And that's why eventually you reach to a diffusion constant, which is order one over delta, which is independent of gamma, because if you just impose continuity at, uh, at this uh, crossover point, you see that the gamma and gamma cancel out. So what is this time, what is this time scales? Basically, you can imagine that this uh, domain of bound states that are frozen at this, they don't move, uh, but they can have like a, uh, one of the, uh, the magnets in this domain can have a, a little virtual op, namely can just extend a little bit out of the system. This is allowed with probability that one of a delta square. And now the noise come and just uh, kill this and separate the two and create a magnet. So basically you have a, a virtual magnet popping up, but the noise put it on shell and now it can propagate. And, and you see that these time scales that you can get them from very simple fermi golden rule arguments com are completely good to uh, reproduce your numerical data. And you really clearly see this, the emergence of the time scales and this uh, um, diffusion constant that really goes to a value, which is one constant over delta independent of gamma. <clears throat> okay, here, of course, you see some deviation, but these deviations are for uh, if you actually exit this regime of large delta as a small gamma. Okay. You can do the same with Hamiltonian perturbation. For example, you can consider a ladder and introduce some delta J uh, interaction among these two ladder of uh, axis distinct chain. Uh, now, actually, the, this time scale for where you should start seeing diffusion again, actually now it's even larger in, in, uh, in delta. Uh, one estimate is that it's, uh, it orders delta cube. And um, at the diffusion constant, large time should actually decay delta to the minus three over cube. From exactly follow me from the same arguments that are where you actually have a decay at one of a square root of t until this time scale. So again, the delta j, delta j cancel. So it's again independent of the perturbation. Here, the process are a bit different. Here, it's a Hamiltonian perturbation. You cannot just create magnets from nowhere, but you can scatter, for example, bound state of two string that actually would be immobile, but you can scatter them to create a, a one or three and uh, as new magnets that actually move, start, can start moving and then generate diffusion. But if you actually look for the um, probability of this scatter, you know, this is given by the allowed density of states times the probability that uh, these magnets, that this actually the any per local perturbation create magnets. And, uh, and basically you get one of the delta from the from the bandwidth of the of the of the magnets you are created, and one over delta square from the probability that the event occur. So that's why you get one over delta cube. Unfortunately, here we cannot check this prediction because here we are doing a Hamiltonian perturbation. The MRG start creating entanglement, and you cannot go to very large times. Okay, so this would be interesting to check maybe with one of the new, newly developed methods that we have. Uh, for the case of the noise, much better because entanglement at some point get just get killed. Okay, so we have checked that actually uh, manion conservation is important and not just domain wall. So if the, if, the, if the only mechanism at play here was, was domain wall conservation, you actually would expect that this extra time scale would be exponential in delta from uh, this, the, the theorems contained here. But actually, no, you don't just have that. You also have to conserve magnets. And here, as we can see it by creating a, a, another random gain model, where now instead of conserving just the domain walls on two sides, you conserve them on five or six five. For example, you allow process of this type where still conserve number of, man of domain walls, but do not conserve magnets. And here you see that instead you become diffusive. 
So the only no, uh, subdiffusive model is the XNOR, which indeed uh, uh, somehow conserve domain wall and magnum numbers. <clears throat> Okay, so this is in some, uh, I think it's quite relevant to what uh, we were saying today, the, we listened today uh, for the, um, how to create like uh, dissipative induced methods to uh, access spin transport. So in, indeed, in this paper of, uh, um, last year, they indeed noticed that if you actually uh, perturb your, your system in order to decrease the entanglement and access the, the diffusion constant of your real system, if you're close to integrability, you observe a no monotonicity in the strength of your, of your gamma, where gamma is basically how much you're killing, how much dissipation you're putting in your system. And this may be related. Basically, the fact that indeed uh, the, the spin dynamics is non-perturbative in, uh, in this gamma close to integrability. In a sense, you would have to if you, you would have to keep track of the fact that these magnets uh, have to probabilate, ba probabilate ballistically, in a sense. In the moment you're putting them on noise, you observe a completely different physics. <clears throat> okay, let me skip this. So as a conclusion, uh, what we observe is that uh, the dynamic of spin transport is really non-perturbative. You go from some value to completely different value as you switch on slight uh, perturbation as you're, and when you're close to integrability. And this is basically due to the interplay of the manual physics and the kinetic constraints that you have in this kind of chains, uh, anisotropic chains. <clears throat> you, you observe subdiffuse spin transfer for this in very long intermediate time scales and the final diffusion constant is heavily suppressed um, to a value which is uh, mostly independent of the integrability breaking parameter, which is quite interesting. And it's even ro more robust for Hamiltonian perturbation. It would be nice to explore it with the more advanced method. Uh, but as, as I said, now uh, we were kind of happy that we could get all this time scale with very basic arguments, but it's completely missing a quantitative description. For example, the scaling function that I show you, we don't know what is it. Uh, for this, we will have to go into like more um, refined uh, quantum Boltzmann equations that uh, so far is still an open question, even in the ballistic case. So from the, uh, in a sense, from the real GHD work, there is uh, still a lot of way to go. Okay, and done. Thanks a lot for your attention.